This is the Comics Alternative Interviews, a conversation with Hoche Anderson. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Comics Alternative Interviews. I'm Derek. And I'm Gene. And we're two guys with PhDs talking about comics with a cartoonist. That's right. And that cartoonist that we will be talking with on this episode is Hoche Anderson. His new book, Godhead, comes out next week from Fantagraphics. And we have a wonderful conversation with Ho, and we are going to share that with you. But before that, we want to tell you that this episode of the Comics Alternative Interviews is brought to you by those wonderful folks at Discount Comic Book Service. Go to their website, dcbservice.com, for all of your comics pre-ordering needs. There, you're going to find all DC, Marvel, Image, and Dark Horse titles at 40% off of the cover price if you pre-order. For all of the other publishers, you'll find that those discounts are anywhere from 20 to 35% off of the cover price. And every single month, you're going to find some incredible specials. Sometimes those specials could be as much as 45% off at the cover price, sometimes 50% off cover, but occasionally you can find discounts that are even more impressive than that. And this month at DCB Service, we've got, uh, once again, Bundle Madness. I really need to get one of those little ka-ching buttons, uh, because I always want to say say Bundle Madness. Uh, But uh, we've got a DC Vertigo bundle, we've got DC Young Animal bundle. Young Animal is fun, and it's wacky enough that we could almost talk about those books in the comics alternative because some of those books are that obscure and interesting we got marvel fresh start bundle we got uh, valiant bundle bundles all over the place and they're almost all 50 percent off you know you really can't beat the great discounts at discount comic book service if for no other reason discounts in their name Go to dcbservice.com they will take care of all of your comics pre-ordering needs And after you do get your titles there, please be sure to send them an email and tell them that the two guys with PhDs sent you. Yep. By the way, Gene, we did talk about young animal titles on a past episode. So there you go. There you go. And we may in a future one as well. I should listen to our show more. (laughs) Uh, but on this episode of the interview series, we really do have a fun conversation with Hochi Anderson. And you know, as we point out at the beginning of our conversation, Gene, both of us are longtime fans of Anderson's work. I I didn't even know that he was coming out with this new book until a few months ago. And I'm glad to have him on the podcast because, uh, you know, talking with him not only about the new book, Godhead, but about his previous work. We talked about I Want to Be Your Dog. We talked about King as well as other things. Yeah, the first thing I'd seen by him was uh, the was the very first volume of King. And I was blown away not just by the art, but by the storytelling itself. I wish I didn't get a chance to tell him this uh, when, when, when we actually did the interview. But uh, the fact that it's not just a straightforward biography, we've got a lot of. Uh, different points of view mixed in it, it 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 in one of those horrible literary terms it's a text that kind of problemizes its own narrative but in a really really interesting way and uh, i was just really struck by him not just as an artist but as a storyteller right. and that, that continues right through into godhead yes uh you know we did have a great conversation we should point out though that there are two or three occasions during our interview with Ho Chi Anderson that the connection sounds a little staticky or iffy um we called Ho up on his telephone and so he didn't have a direct Skype connection but we used Skype in order to dial him up on the phone and it could have been because he was using the phone and there was something going on or it could be an internet thing but there are a couple of times that things get a little staticky but you can still pretty much understand what he's saying and those moments are very brief yeah they're pretty brief so as soon as you start if you start to say what is that in the next five seconds, it's done. So Exactly. Um, you know, another thing that I don't think we ever got around to discussing with Ho was the premise of this first volume of Godhead, did we? Well, I mean – We talked around it. 
we, we, we talked around it. We talked about a lot of the things. And if you've already read the book, it makes perfect sense. Right. But nobody else here has read the book yet because it hasn't come out yet. So let's uh, let just uh, for a, a brief teaser, let's just read you what the book tells us it's about from the back of the book. When a powerful multinational corporation creates a machine that can communicate with God, does it spell humanity's salvation or the end of days? The sprawling saga set in the not so distant future explores the collision courses among science, religion, and corporate greed. And that's a really good uh, brief overview of kind of the setup for the book. Uh, I think there's a lot more going on to it than that as well. And something we talk about in the interview a good bit is the interpersonal relationships. It's a book about ideas, but it's also a book about people. And the people don't necessarily embody ideas, but they're operating in a world of ideas. And that's another thing that I really like about the book. Yes. And as we bring up several times during the interview, this is quite an ambitious project. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, We did have a fun conversation. So let's go ahead and listen to that now. We're pleased to have on the Comics Alternative, Hoche Anderson. His new book, Godhead, comes out next week from Fantagraphics. Ho, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much, gentlemen. I'm very happy to be here. Yeah, we're really ha- we're really happy to have you. It's a I've I've, I've read your stuff from early. Well, I didn't I didn't I haven't read the, the like the uh, I want to be a dog, but with King and stuff like that, I've always loved your stuff, and I've never. I've read very few interviews with you. I haven't seen you at conventions or anything like that. So it's great to be able to meet you and uh, learn a little more about uh, what you do and how you do it. Awesome. Thanks so much. Yeah, I've had a very unorthodox career in that uh, I've been around for a while and I've been somewhat respected by people, but um, I haven't managed to kind of branch out too far beyond my indie roots or to get out to too many conventions unfortunately so i'm hoping to change that in the next like year or so but um yeah it's been I've been a little bit uh sort of the mystery cartoonist for most of my career <laughs> yeah um you know i'm with gene in terms of being a big fan of your work from way back and in fact uh i think it was the very first class that i taught that was devoted specifically or solely to comics uh i used king as one of the, oh, wow. the classroom texts. I think this was about a year before the book went out of print, or at least the, the softbound <laughs> edition. And so in following right. semesters, I, I, I couldn't use the book because I couldn't get enough copies. But uh, um, <laughs> but yeah, it, it, it's absolutely a, a wonderful book. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. And, um, you know, several months ago when we saw that Godhead was being solicited, I got excited because I couldn't remember the last time I saw a book from you. Um, was the, the previous one uh, 2013's Miles from Home? Um, yes. Before that, it was uh, this very dark, angry horror story that I did called uh, Sand and Fury. I mean, I took a break for a little while and I cranked out uh, – miles from home and then yeah i took a little break and back with this one i'm hoping not to take such a long break again though um i want to kind of get back to the sort of warm embrace of comic books after kind of being out in the wilderness for a little while <laughs> well, and that, that wilderness I, I i saw a couple of interviews with you that you said that that wilderness was film or at least part of yeah. it was film yeah i got into the movie business um it's something i want to like kind of keep like one foot in one foot in the comics world and one foot in the movie world but um, the movies have been like a long, a lifelong obsession and something, you know, an itch I've been wanting to scratch for a long, long time. So I went to film school and got involved with the film community in a pretty deep way. And then I got into uh, the film union, became a, a camera assistant and uh, realized just how incredibly stressful the movie world is and how kind of not, not to say that the comics world doesn't have its own unique stresses, but not like the crazy stress that's involved with the movie world. So uh, after a few years of that, it was like, maybe I'm rethinking this decision a little bit. Maybe this wasn't the best move for me to make. <laughs> uh, well, you know, it after having read Godhead, it in many ways, it kind of made sense that it was a while between Miles from Home and this new book, because 
I mean, damn, this this thing is really ambitious. When when I saw it solicited at first, I didn't know that this was going to be the first volume in I don't know how many you have projected, but uh in in this book that's coming out next week, um we have the first installment and you have a number of characters, various storylines going on. In other words, there are a lot of moving parts to this narrative, quite ambitious. And so we need other volumes to to really have these characters play out uh, thoroughly. And, and yeah. so I'm curious, I mean, how many volumes do you have planned for Godhead? Um, well, there are going to be two volumes for sure. Um, the story comes to an end after that. Originally, it was going to be four smaller books, and then we kind of decided to collapse collapse it into two volumes instead, so chapters one and two in the first book and chapters three and four in the second book. Then it comes to like a definite end, and maybe I shouldn't say too much more than that. I was going to kind of say something that kind of revealed a bit too much of the ending, but um, <laughs> the story does come to an end. But I'm hoping if, uh, if there's some interest and if there's enough to sell a few books, um, I'd love to return to this world. It was an incredible amount of fun to kind of inhabit this world for the time that I've been doing it. It's like I've, I've had like a lifelong obsession with science fiction. I loved science fiction when I was a kid. It was Star Wars that kind of got me interested in becoming a storyteller in the first place. And throughout my entire career, um, I'd always loved sci-fi, but I'd never really had the, never really felt I had the, um, I guess the, uh, the creative chops to pull it off properly. And, uh, but at a certain point I realized, you know what, I've kind of done this for a while. I've got a certain skill set. Let me see if I can actually pull this off. And, Godhead was the result of it, and uh, yeah, it was a tremendous amount of fun. So if I get the opportunity, I would love to return to it because there are other stories that I could tell in this world. But I don't want to be too presumptuous and say, you know, you know, it's going to be successful enough for that to happen. It'd be great though. <laughs> yeah. Now you mentioned that the original idea was to come out with four, I guess, small-ish volumes, but you decide yeah. to at least at this first volume, and I guess you're doing the same with the next book, uh, putting yeah. the two, two of those projected initial uh, single volumes into into one. So the the two yeah. chapters in this book, this new one, is corporate world mm-hmm. and then city and sand. Yes, sir. Um, now you you describe this as a work of science fiction, and it is. But one of the things that I very much appreciate about it is it's kind of a subtle science fiction because there's much that goes on in this story that is not necessarily science fictiony, mm-hmm. but in some of the ways that you illustrate your story world, you can tell that this takes place at some kind of future time, but the situation, the relationships and the conflicts that we have going on, even what appears to be some kind of central premise, right? The ability to communicate with God in some way um, Mm -hmm. uh, is not necessarily linked to, let's say various science fiction icons or conventions. No, I mean, I definitely think of it as a work of science fiction, but it's also, um, and that I think becomes perhaps a little bit more apparent um, as the story goes on, especially in the second volume where we unleash the killer robots and, and you know, <laughs> yeah. so on and so forth. Um, I, I guarantee those things are coming down the line. But uh, yeah, it's um, it, it's also, I guess, I, I guess a work of speculative fiction might be perhaps a little bit more accurate to what it is. Um, it's definitely... Um, I mean, it's it's definitely an action adventure story, and it's definitely a science fiction story. But it's also kind of um, my attempt at, um, I guess, a kind of a subtle social commentary in that it's about you know the collision between uh, the corporate elite and on the one side, and also you know somebody who's uh, come from a you know a lower socioeconomic caste on the other side, and how those two kind of opposing forces collide and, and what happens after that collision. You know, we've got the, the the main, I guess the main character, ostensibly the main character, the CEO of the corporation that creates the God machine, who is a plutocrat. And then we've got the former soldier, um, uh, uh, who's, I guess, like the secondary character, or the co-lead, however you want to look at it, um, who comes from, you know, who's like the opposite of an elite. You know, he's the one who fights the wars that, that the plutocrat um, sets up. Uh, so, you know, I guess the story is about what happens when those two characters are kind of forced to confront each other. Yeah. And it's interesting that we kind of start off with that confrontation and then we kind of split apart and we're almost in, it almost feels like two different worlds for 
a lot of the book and uh, we're trying to figure out uh, I'm, I'm i'm one of the things that that's intriguing is that these two like you said kind of co-main characters are so very different at least in come from where they're where they're coming from and uh, kind of where they're grounded into but uh it's clear that there's there's something more that that's going to happen to kind of bring all this together and i'm one and for me, I'm just I'm wondering where this is an odd question. Where does God fit into all of this? <laughs> um, that's an interesting question. Um, I, I think um, I think I put this. One of the things I was interested in is um, kind of exploring how how the corporations are kind of the new religion that most of us subscribe to, um, and whether we want to or not. And we're living in a world where, you know, corporations can privatize things like, or like rainwater, like, you know, like, like the, the very things that we need to survive on a daily basis. And so we're dealing with a story here where you've got a corporation that's interested in privatizing faith, privatizing religion, and has found a way to kind of, you know, to make those things concrete and, and saleable. And uh, so, yeah, I guess I'm sort of like using God as almost a metaphor for, you know, the way corporations act in our day to day life, if that makes any sense. Mm. You know, you were uh, mentioning a moment ago one of the the main characters who is the CEO. Uh, Right before Gene and I dialed you up for this interview, we were trying to recall if in anywhere in this text we learned the CEO's name. And I couldn't remember. <laughs> is there any place in this book where the CEO's name is mentioned even briefly? The, C- the CEO's name is not mentioned even one time in the entire story. Ah, because <laughs> so, he's called he's, Sir by almost everyone. <laughs> he's called Sir. He's called the CEO. Uh, yeah, that's – yeah, Mr. CEO. That's about the extent of his designation. For for me, he was – That's in a way, I, I don't – how can I put this? If if you read the entire story, there's kind of a reason why I don't give him a name because he's he kind of represents the machine, he represents the corporation, and he is the face of the corporation. And his name, in a sense, is sort of irrelevant to um, what his function is and what his position is. And all that becomes very concrete in the second chapter. But uh, yeah, so there there was kind of a there was a bit of a narrative reason and a thematic reason why I didn't give him a name. But I was also kind of curious just to see if I could play just a game, you know, just to see if I could like <laughs> create a character where you didn't you didn't know the guy's name, you know, and nobody actually actually said his name. And could I sustain that kind of tight rapport for an entire book, hopefully without it becoming too much of a mannerism? So it was a bit of a it was a bit of an experiment on my part to see if I could make that work. Yeah, because I I could have swore. As I was reading it, I thought of, at one point I thought I saw his name, but then it didn't come up again. And when again, when Derek and I were talking, like I'm pretty sure it's there, but I went back to the places, the pages where I thought I had a visual memory of. It. It's like, no, that's not it. No, it's not it. That that's that's not his name. It's somebody else's. But yeah, but I like how like on, on the the cover of the book is a straight on shot of a uh, fa- uh, uh, full on face of the CEO. And the word Godhead, the, the title is not just the title of the book. It's like kind of superimposed over his face, yeah. even down to like the, the H in head is kind of like very symmetrical over his nose. And that seems like uh, th- that, that may be a little uh, visual, vi- visual metaphor happening there. Could be. Who knows? And, I guess and we'll then the, to, and, to the end of the book. Yeah. And then, and then the back of the book uh, with the. Uh, 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 close up of Racer's face, also, but uh, he's he does not have Godhead written over his face. <laughs> no, what he has is a huge punch to the eyeball. This right. He's got. Yeah, everybody's traumatized on that cover. Yeah, he has got a huge gash on his cheek, and Racer's been pulverized by who knows what. Yeah, well, you know, we also have the large head that we see in the opening pages after the CEO escapes. From captivity, and then yeah. uh, there is the board member who also is a sculptor, Chavez, who, when mm-hmm. the CEO visits him, is working on a head. Yes, yes, that's his uh, his particular that's his particular way of talking to God, um, uh, and and we'll see throughout sprinkled throughout the story. You'll see many of those. Um, mm-hmm. I guess those are Godheads of us. A- of a sort, kind of sprinkled throughout the city, just sort of, you know, in corners. Not necessarily the attention being called to themselves, but there they are. If you if you care to notice them, 
Um, yeah, yeah. I guess it's in a way it's sort of a, it's a, a society obsessed with faith and with God. Um, you know, people searching for God in the godless world, kind of thing. I guess you know, perhaps very much like today in some ways. I'm not sure. Yeah, and it also feels a little big brothery too. Yeah, definitely, definitely. You know, that's also the corporation kind of looking down and you're mm-hmm. making sure that you're following the rules and that uh, you're not stepping too far out of line. Absolutely. Yeah, because the first time we see one of those big heads is early on. I think it's page 14. And right before that, uh, as the CEO is kind of walking through, uh, after he's escaped, he's walking through an alley or something like that. And we actually get like a dot, like one of the few like cartoony things in the book is the dotted line of his line of sight leading towards a gap in a wall. You turn the page and then there's the giant head. So it's very much like it's 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 almost like the opposite of like the God rays coming down. It's like he's looking up to see that and we're really really supposed to take note of that of that yeah. moment because you don't do yeah. much of that uh, much of that's kind of like uh, uh motion lines or sound of, or, or uh, kind of that kind of overtly cartoony stuff that way i still got a fair bit of that in me though like um you know like you'll very frequently see you know sweat falling off of my characters when they're nervous or Stuff like that. I mean, I don't, I don't overdo it, but there's still a part of me that, you know, like I loved Richie Rich and you know, <laughs> Hank Hudson comics when I was a little kid, and you know, so that that stuff is very much in me. I don't want to, I don't want to lose that completely. You know? mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, you know, on, on the topic of heads, uh, you know, sculpted and otherwise, we do see, if if not heads, then faces on the front of some of the vehicles in this text. Yes. Yeah. So faces and yeah, heads absolutely. are a visual motif that are woven throughout. Yeah, the idea for that was um, basically um, the uh, Chavez, who uh, you know obviously is the sculptor of all those enormous heads throughout the city. Um, he's uh, you know part businessman, part artist, and he uses his enormous wealth, enormous wealth, to kind of um, impose his artistic vision upon the city. And, uh, you know, in, you know, somewhere in the history of this story, he was commissioned to create, um, uh, you know, to create his own particular line of, um, the transportation, uh, vehicle that's like predominant throughout the story. And they're called Hummers, um, sort of flying trains. Mm-hmm. And, uh, so the idea is that he was designed, you know, commissioned to design his own version of that and, you know, sort of resorted to that same theme that he's obsessed with, this, you know, this godlike face that's like staring down upon the city. Um, yeah, yeah. So that's, the, that's where that idea came from. Yeah. And, it, and that, that face is very kind of a, not exactly, it's sort of blank and expressionless. Mm-hmm. It's just, it's just kind of there, almost like the CEO's face on the cover, just kind of staring, not, there's almost since there's no emotion on it as well. It kind of almost feels like it's more judgmental. It's just kind of like and more it's creepy. Like above, it's it's more creepy. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's a kind of it's kind of above and beyond because again the the characters in the book are really well defined. Uh, just the uh, uh, kind of thematically with how they act, uh, what they say, what they think, how they interact with each other, and also how they're drawn as well. So it's a really stark contrast to have these really emotionless faces. And amongst the story where the character interaction really is what's carrying things primarily. That was fascinating to hear, actually. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's curious. And I mean, and, and the truth is, they're sort of meant to be ciphers in a way. The CEO is meant to be a bit of a cipher, and those faces are meant to meant to be ciphers. And my, my, I'm glad to hear that they're creepy. I never thought <laughs> that they were judgmental, though. <laughs> you know, I never thought of them as being judgmental, but I, I love that. I mean, my conception of, of God you know, for good or ill is of, is of a judgmental being. A, cre- um, a creepy judgmental face. Ex- exactly. You know, staring down at us and not, not <laughs> intervening when, when he or she could, but just letting whatever happens play out. Oh, you fucked up tough shit. Because you messed up somehow. And, uh, I, yeah, so it's, that's, yeah, I, I like that. That kind of fits in thematically was what I was going for. One last thing on the, on the faces. Another thing that kind of fascinated me uh, kind of stylistically as we go through, we've got a lot of like little inset panels of faces and especially eyes, a little, little like a glances back and forth between characters, but just very, very small, like little inset things that are just like flavoring as you go through. In the midst of a bigger scene, suddenly you will just get a two or three little overlap panels of just fa- parts of faces and especially eyes. 
You know, I think um, as you're describing that, I think that's my inner uh, Frank Miller and my inner Chagan coming out. If, uh, <laughs> if you go through a lot of their work, you'll see sort of a similar stylistic uh, yeah. I don't know, flair or tick or whatever. Those are two of my bedrock heroes. So, yeah, I, I think that's uh, I think that's channeling me channeling those guys a little bit. But it's interesting you mentioned the faces because um, I sort of recently, very recently came across um, something online talking about um, uh, the work of Jack Kirby, who was like one of my seminal influences. I was absolutely obsessed with Jack Kirby when I was a little kid. And uh, the, the the first stuff that I that I copied as a child was all Jack Kirby comics. And um, I recently found out, uh, you know, that giant faces were... Um, a recurring kind of motif in his work from like the forties up until, up until the end of the end of his career, which I had no idea about it. It recurred in a bunch of his science fiction stories from the forties and the fifties, especially. Oh yeah. And, uh, recurred in his work up in, you know, up until 2001, adapting 2001, which I had no idea about. So it was kind of an interesting, I don't know, kind of an interesting link for me just as a, as an admirer of Kirby and a lover of his stuff. You know, another thing about Godhead that I noticed, in addition to, you know, the head in face, um, you know, iconic motif, is the number of doublings and mirroring that you have going on throughout the the story. So, I mean, we've already mentioned the doubling of the two main protagonists. There's the CEO and then there's Racer Calhoun. But then yeah. there are doublings and mirrorings that, that are attached to those two. So... Uh, you know, Racer's girlfriend is Carrie's, and then the CEO has a relationship with Dr. Fancy. Yeah. But then we have, in some ways, another doubling that seems to be going on between another main female protagonist, and that is Bertie Brooks. And then I kind of maybe link her, you know, for good or ill to, to Dr. Fancy. Um, also, Racer's relationship with Red is not entirely different from CEO's relationship to either Dr. Fancy or maybe even Bertie Brooks. And then we have Oceanus and then Cadre Zeus, Oceanus and Verbuten. Uh, in other words, there are all of these pairings. I could go even on and on about more of these, but it okay. seems to be baked into your story. So I'm, this was intentional? You know, I wish that I could take claim, I could lay claim to that, but it wasn't. Um, these are the kind of, you know, certainly. It, even even with even with the founder's name Jackson Jackson. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> wow, I didn't even put that together. Uh, well, you've got a two fetish. I guess I do. <laughs> Some kind of weird doppelganger thing going on with me that I wasn't aware of. Um, definitely, it was intentional in the case of. Um, in the case of Racer and, and the CEO, they were always uh, meant to be sort of yin and yang characters, for sure. Um, they were always meant to sort of comment on each other. But uh, I, I guess, um, you know, I think when you're working on a piece and, you know, you spend enough time sort of thinking about the themes, um, they just start to express themselves naturally in, in ways that you wouldn't necessarily have, you know, thought of consciously. So I'm sure on some on some fundamental level, uh, you know, all those things that you described were, were playing in my mind, but at no point did I actually sort of map out, you know, this relation is a corollary to this relation and so on and so forth. Um, yeah, they just kind of evolved as they evolved, but it's good to hear that there's some kind of like, you know, thematic uh, overlay uh, in the relationships. I think that's cool. Yeah. You know, I was thinking about it just now and even, I mean, you could even pair – uh, Dr. Fancy and Chavez, because both in their own way are philosophers, you know, mm, that's true. You know, Chavez is perhaps a little more palatable than the philosophy we seem to be getting from Dr. Fancy. And by the way, um, Gene and I were wondering about the first name of this female Dr. Fancy, James. Mm -hmm. uh, what were your thoughts? I'm curious to hear. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know about Gene, but I didn't know what to make of it. You know, I, I, it's pretty simple. I just, I've always kind of liked uh, women with with male names for some reason. Um, I used to know someone named Michael, uh, like a good female friend of mine years and years ago, was named Michael, which just kind of worked for me for some reason. That's something I've kind of played with in my stories over the years. So, yeah, just I, I just kind of like the idea of men men's names on women. Less less attractive when it's a woman's name on a guy for some reason, but uh, yeah, what are you gonna do? Um, another thing about this 
book uh, that I really enjoyed is, I guess, your subtle sense of humor that comes out every now and again, and especially at the beginning, because when someone gets the book and they look at the opening pages before they get to the story proper, right, that first chapter, uh, corporate world, yeah. um, across two pages, you write out, are you sitting comfortably? <laughs> then we'll <Yeah>. begin <laughs> is on the following page. Yeah. I like that. I mean, it, 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 it expressed a kind of intimacy with, uh, uh, you know, a little wink, humorous wink, uh, right before we get into your narrative. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we, 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 we tease, are you sitting comfortably with a lovely lady kind of beckoning us <laughs> into the story? And then the next mm -hmm. page is a guy getting smashed in the face. Um, I don't know what that says, but, uh, there you go. You know, when I was, when I was a child, I loved, um, Beatrix Potter story. She was, um, this English storyteller and my parents had, a um, got me a, a collection of their, of her stories and, uh, they would always begin, are you sitting comfortably? Then we'll begin. So it's something I've always kind of had in my head from childhood. Um, That's fantastic. Story, you know what I mean? The story was like nothing if not sort of exercising a lot of childhood uh, demons and obsessions and fantasies. Um, yeah. And also when I was a teenager, um, I was in love with this uh, pop band called uh, Platinum Blonde, a Canadian new wave band. And on their first record, they started the record with, um, with I think, actually... I think it was like the singer's mother saying those very words, are you sitting comfortably? So it's got, uh, it's just got resonance in my, from my childhood. Interesting. Yeah. And it, it really is an, a, an, an unexpected way to open the book because you expect like, you know, fancy end papers or whatever. And we've got giant blow ups from panels within. But I was happy as I was going through the book to see where those images uh, actually came from. Right, because cool. at first they just, they're, they're so juxtaposed because again, the, the, the are you are you sitting comfortably page is hand drawn, and then we'll begin. Not only is it a is it a is a punch, is it a punch in the face, but it's also one of the painted pages. So we even get a there's a, there's a big uh, tonal shift there, it, it, which is also a kind of a slap in the face. Here's one thing, oh, and here's something totally different. Nice, nice. I like that. So what? And that and that brings us to like the end of the book. We get some of those first pages again, which the the, the pages which are painted in color, which you say originally the book was going to be painted in color and then you made a decision to switch it up can you talk a little bit about that process of coming to the style of the book and why you ch why it looks the way it does absolutely um so i mentioned that um this book is sort of a repository of like you know a lot of stuff that i've taken in over the years and fantasized about over the years and uh so the desire to do a painted comic book came from two sources um as a child and as an adult, um, I've just been a massive, massive fan of uh, the of the production art of Ralph McQuarrie. Um, <laughs> as a god to me, I'm just insane about Ralph McQuarrie. A friend of mine, we're, we're really obsessed with his work. Sorry? Are we related? <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've still got you know, my Return of the Jedi portfolio. Oh, dude, I've I, I've got um, I've I've got uh, a, a Star Wars portfolio where it's uh, oh like my, yeah, I've never had that one. But the my the crowning glory of my career, my collection is a two hundred dollar book that I that I bought called uh, the Art of Ralph McQuarrie, and I never pay that kind of money for anything other than like a, a Ralph McQuarrie tome, and it's got hundreds of like you know his production art over the years and his work I from have, Boeing and blah blah blah. I've lusted over that book, but I do not own it. Uh, dude, it's incredible, man. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's well worth owning. Sucked up way too much of my time. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I was like, really, I was really wanting to do something, um, just, to, um, in that style, just cause I was just so obsessed with Robin Curry's production paintings. And uh, also I was massively, uh, obsessed, uh, with, uh, with the painted comics of the 1980s. You know, Bill Sienkiewicz was a God to me and, uh, you know, mm -hmm. Kent Williams and all those guys that were like kicking ass in the eighties. Um, Dave McCain, even though I guess he's more of nineties era, but still, um, the guys who could like wheel paint, uh, like it was nothing. Those are the ones who really impressed me. So taking those two influences, I thought I want to create a story, kind of a big grand sci-fi epic. And what kind of story can I create that would support, you know, like, you know, that kind of lush vision. And so that's kind of how this story kind of came about in its most basic way. And, uh, yeah, so I was really excited about, um, creating a story 
um, you know, and kind of giving it this sort of like big treatment. Um, the only problem was it was taking forever to complete a page. Like, I don't know how Bill Sienkiewicz was, I managed to pull off all those pages that he did in the eighties and nineties. But, uh, mm-hmm. like for me, it was taking, you know, upwards of three or four days a page. Uh, that's, yeah, I mean, it's going to take me the rest of my life if I were continued on those page along that pace to, uh, to finish the book. Cause this thing's about 250, 270 pages altogether. That's a lot of work. And also I was having a tough time selling the book. And I, I just thought, you know, at a certain point, um, I kind of abandoned the comic cause I wasn't getting any headway in selling it. And it kind of lay on the shelf for a bunch of years. I threw it aside. I said, I'm never going to touch this comic again. It's a dead thing, but it stayed in my head for whatever reason. I could not get it out. And it just kind of kept plaguing me. And, uh, and then at a certain point, I realized that if I changed the style up to black and white, I could crank the pages out a lot faster and I'd have a better shot at actually getting the thing out there. So I switched it up to black and white. But you know, I'm glad I made that decision just because, you know, now the thing's like an actual book, but, uh, <laughs> you know, as opposed to a dream. But at the same time, I kind of longed for the for what it could have been, you know, it, it, it would have been, it been a, it would have been a beautiful book, but such is life. So it goes. You know, you mentioned that this idea had been in your head for quite a while. I mean, when did you first begin working on what we now know of as this first volume of Godhead? Well, um, it was 2000. I'll tell you the exact origins of this book. So around 2002, 2001, 2002, I was not doing as much comic book work. I was doing a lot of um, illustrations for magazines and advertising, that kind of thing. And uh, I was enjoying it, but um, it wasn't quite as creatively satisfying as I as I um, as I was hoping it would be. So I started thinking, and uh, around this time I was actually also finishing up um, the third volume of King. So uh, I started thinking maybe it's time to start a you know start thinking more seriously about comic books again. And at the same time, I still wanted to maintain my illustration career. So I was thinking about doing a story called Morris Minor which was going to be sort of a seventies era crime story. And, uh, and at the same time as I was thinking about that crime story, I was also thinking about doing, um, uh, like an illustration portfolio, like a mailer to send out to art directors and whatnot. And I thought uh, maybe I should target the corporate world because there's money to be made doing corporate you know, presentation, corporate mm-hmm. illustration, that kind of thing. Um, so those two streams kind of played in my head for a while. And, um, as I started to thinking about thinking about them, over time they started to merge. So the Morris Minor idea sort of evolved into Racer's story, and the corporate world, you know, portfolio emerged into the CEO story. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Around the same time, and all this was going on, um, recently September 11th had happened. So there was a certain kind of paranoia and fear um, in the air, and a, and a kind of a sort of a martial nature because, you know, you know, North America was about to go off to war again. And, uh, and there's a lot of, you know, kind of anger, and, you know, in the air. So the story is sort of borne out to a certain extent, um, from the kind of 2001 paranoia that existed at the time. Um, yeah. Yeah. So those are, those are kind of the origins of the story. Well, I hadn't realized it, it, it would have gone back that far, but that's – it's kind of interesting that uh, you were thinking about trying to break into the corporate world of comics, and then the, the corporation in the comic is kind of like the big bad sort of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, uh, they may be the big bad, but they've got money to spend, so you yeah. know, I can't say I'm above <laughs> sucking on the corporate cheat if it comes down to it. <laughs> yeah. Those bills have got to get paid. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's also interesting to learn that the roots of Godhead go back around the time in your career when you're about to wrap up the three, the initial three volumes of King. I mean, some people may not know that what we have now as, if you want to call it a graphic novel or graphic biography, King, it started off as three smaller stories. And was uh, that linked to your original plans to publish this story in four smaller volumes, kind of like you did with the three in King? Yeah, I mean, I've always... I guess it's in some ways kind of a dead model to a certain extent, but, um, you know, I grew up in that, up in 
And at that time, the, the model was, excuse me, was the, you know, you release a miniseries and then you, you got one revenue stream that way and then you collect it into a book and then you got a second revenue stream that way and then also the book kind of like go, lives on in eternity in that collected form. And that's how, that's the model that King was born out of. Um, you know, the plan always from the start was to break one giant story down into three, into three volumes, into three chapters. And then once that was completed, um, you know, collected into, into one book. But I guess the model has kind of changed these days where, you know, pamphlet comics are not selling as well as trades and so on and so forth. So, you know, the decision was made. To, and you know, I, I wanted to to do Godhead kind of the way we done King to do it in four smaller books, you know, that culminated into one big story. But um, you know, they told me that uh, that was probably you know that was probably death on the stand. So that's kind of why we switched from four chapters to two chapters because I still like the idea of uh, of serialized storytelling, um, but the publisher doesn't. So much, so it's a sort of a compromise between the two of us. You know, I, I get sort of what I want, and he gets, you know, less individual books to publish. Right. Uh, you've 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 mentioned uh, uh, several times, kind of like when you get to the end of the story, you're going to see this. How far are you in the second volume, or is the second volume already done? No, God, I wish the second volume were already done. <laughs> <you know. laughs> well, the second volume is going to be about a hundred and probably about 160 pages long and I'm 47 pages into volume two. So I got a ways to go. I'm going to be drawing this, this sucker for a little while. Um, yeah. And, 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 you know, to be totally honest, I've had to sort of take on other work to, uh, you know, to keep a roof over my head while I'm working on this thing because the advance for this puppy ran out a long time ago. So what that means on a practical level is that, you know, it's going to take a little bit longer than I would like to, you know, I can't devote as much time to it on a day-to-day -day level as I would love to. My dream would be to spend, you know, get up every day and get it done until, you know, and work on it every day until it's finished. But, uh, the realities of life uh, living in a big city means, you know, I got to take on other work, sadly. But that having been said, it, it is going to get finished, I promise you. After this much time spent <laughs> on it, you know, like I, I need to get it done just so I can clear the mental space, you know, and devote that to something else. Yeah, and we're, and we're, and we're going to need the closure on this also. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, not, not putting pressure on you, but I want to know how this ends. <laughs> I want to read that. I promise you, it, it will end. It's, I hope it's going to end in a satisfying way. The first half was more um, uh, kind of um, discussions of philosophy and, and setup, and, and it's more character based. Uh, but you know, but I, I hint at the beginning that that you know you're in for action in the second half, and, and I think I delivered in the second half. The second half is pretty action heavy. Um, I, I think I, I think that I still wrap it up in a in a satisfying way thematically, but the guns and the violence definitely come out in force and, and behind the robots. Uh, in part two so yeah ho hopefully it'll be a satisfying ending um ideally w do you have plans let's say after you come out with the the second volume which i'm assuming will also be in paperback maybe coming out with a complete edition even after that of both volumes in one kind of like you did with king absolutely oh yeah for sure for sure yeah the i i definitely intend to uh to collect it all into one fat book. And I'm actually really looking forward to that because um, I'm a guy who like loves, you know, the, 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 the supplemental material on the DVD or the Blu-ray. Like I mm -hmm. that stuff up, you know, commentaries and documentaries and all that behind the scenes storyboards, all that stuff. I love that stuff. I'm a big fan of process. Um, for me, when we are related, kind of <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm sensing we've got a lot of things we like in common here. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, no, uh, I, they're doubling. Um, <laughs> yeah, here we go, man. <laughs> Guys, you're going to wind up as characters in the book. Just <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I, anytime process is revealed, I think that that's a great thing. Rather than um, sort of, you know, the magic being taken away, um, I find demystifying things sort of increases the magic. The fact that, you know, you took those sort of disparate things that didn't look like very much when they were stacked side by side, but you put them together and they create something that's more than the sum of their parts. I find that absolutely fascinating. So what I plan to do on the, uh, for the collection is just throw a shit ton of um, behind the scenes stuff, uh, scripts, notes, sketches, um, you know, 
production art, like any, anything I've got that that may be vaguely of interest to people who are who are interested in the process. I'm gonna I'm gonna throw that in there. Or even things well, that you could. Um you know, potentially leave out of a more complete edition that originally appeared in one of the first two volumes, because I that's one of the things that fascinated me about that first complete collection, not the deluxe one, but the one that came out, I guess, in tw- what? Two, I can't remember when, but the, the complete came. Yeah, 2002, yeah. 2003, something like that. Yeah, you had um, not included all the scenes that were in the original run yeah. of King in those three volumes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, I chopped out a bunch of stuff. Um, I threw a bunch of it back in for the special edition, but that was like, you know, that was a very that's that the special edition of King is, is exactly what I was talking about for for the collected edition of Godhead, you know, because I threw a ton of st- behind the scenes stuff in that book, including the stuff um, that I that I chopped out. And usually, I'm kind of wary about that kind of thing. Like, I think um, once uh, you know, once the project is done and it's it be, you know it's it's not yours so much anymore, you know. It kind of it belongs to whomever happens to pick it up. It's got a life outside of it, outside of the creator's hands. And I think a lot of times when creators go back in and they they you know they jigger with their material, um, it can often be to diminishing returns. But there are some things in that first book that I just uh, every time I looked at them, they just sort of rubbed me the wrong way. So I had to. I had to, I had to, I had to just try, just try a volume that you know that didn't have that stuff in it, and see how I felt about it. And then I felt comfortable throwing it back in for the collected edition, so it was there for anybody who you know had any interest in reading it for whatever reason. But yeah, yeah, I hated to do a George Lucas on it, but uh, <laughs> I had to. <laughs> or, or the close card is the third kind. We don't need to see the inside of a spaceship. There you go. <laughs> um. Okay, so, so we'll resist the the temptation to ask around when do you think that the uh, the final volume of Godhead will come out? It'll come out when it comes out. <laughs> well, I, listen, it's like it's number one on my priority list, so I'm seriously hoping to have to have it like ready for publication by this time next year. That's that's my desire. Let's see how the reality plays out. But that that that's the intention. Like I, I'm very. I mean, it's not. A, you know, I'm excited by it. You know, I want to spend my time doing this comic book. It's a dream come true to do this thing. So uh, yeah, yeah, I, I, I really want to stick with it. Now, now, do you see Godhead as? I guess in ways that. You know, I see King. I, I mean, I look at your body of work, and you know, I want to be your dog. Your your series with Santiago Pop Life, you know, Sand and Fury. Yep. We've mentioned Miles from Home. You know, King though is a long form narrative. You know, right covering yes. the life of Martin Luther King, and then Godhead strikes me as a work very much like that, where you have, you know, quite a long form style of storytelling. Different mm-hmm. from I Want to Be Your Dog. I think I, I Want to Be Your Dog oh, came yeah. out as individual comic book issues originally, and there were, what, five of them? Five of them, yeah. Five of them, yeah. Um, I mean, so, you know, it's a, it's a good-sized story, but not near as substantive as King or what Godhead will be. Yeah, and, you know, the thing is, um, I've always preferred to work in this format. It's just, uh, for whatever reason, I've never really had the opportunities come my way to allow me to kind of practice that storytelling. Most of the time, the stuff that's come my way, that's, the, you know, where a paycheck is involved, uh, just tends to be really disparate and, and shorter of form. And, um, and I think also a lot of the time earlier in my career, I was less concerned with um, connecting with an audience. I was more concerned with, for whatever reason, following whatever bizarre muse, you know, just happened to strike my fancy at any particular time. So that resulted in some really hit or miss work. Um, I was just experimenting constantly um, with less concern about kind of building uh, a more consistent body of work. Um, So now, uh, for whatever reason, I've kind of in the corner and I'm really like, you know, I'm the opposite. I'm really interested in, um, in connecting with an audience in a, in a, in a deeper way for sure. And, uh, and with doing less kind of, you know, shorter form esoteric stuff. I want to do stuff. I want to swing from the fence a lot more now. I want to, you know, take on bigger themes and, and support those with bigger visuals and with longer stories, and or at least, if not necessarily longer, at least meatier stories than I've than I've told in the past. So I think uh, kind of Godhead represents um, kind of I guess the next phase and whatever the hell journey this is I'm on. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. It just it's just in terms of scale, like miles from home, 
which I like a lot, is very. It, I mean, it's 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 a short it's a shorter book, but it's very kind of a it's again it's character driven, like just like Godhead. I mean, it, it's it's about character very much so. Yeah. But yeah. this it's it, it the the stakes are high, but the scale is small. I think because yeah, it's well, very it's it's very kind of person. Whereas Godhead, the stakes are high and the scale is broad. Yeah, yeah, that that's definitely true. Actually, I, I would argue the stakes are actually fairly small for they're 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 in in um in Miles from Home. They're they're large just in terms of like you know how the events of the story affect the character. So I guess in that sense, but you know in any other sense, uh, that's like very like that story. That story is like my is part of it was evolved from my art house period. There was a large period in my twenties where. I was really into stories about nothing but character. Plot didn't interest me for a very long time. And I was just really into stories where nothing happened and folks just sort of hung out and talked and blah, blah, blah. And uh, that story was sort of my attempt to do something in that, um, you know, in that realm. And uh, so, and, and I, I worked on it for a long time and I managed to crank a bit of it out. And then it was a certain point and it was, it was appearing in the, my comic pop life with Wolf of San Diego. And that book lasted five issues. And I realized at the end of five issues of drawing Miles from Home, that I was just bored shitless with it. Like, there was nothing <laughs> going on with it. It was just caking forever. I was really into, I really loved um, Dave McKean's book, Cages. Mm-hmm. And I loved how he really kind of, you know, took as much time as he needed to examine every beat, um, you know, of a conversation or, you know, of a, of a meeting between a group of people or whatever. He was in no rush. And I really admired how he handled that. And I was sort of attempting to do something on this, of a similar vein, but it just, oh man, it just became so tedious after a while. But that was another story like, um, uh, like, like Godhead where I thought that I had thrown it aside and couldn't get it out of my head. So uh, after a few years, I kind of, I decided to come back to it, but, but, in, you know, tell the same story, but cut out all the boring parts. <laughs> um, you know, there were like so many more scenes of his characters sitting around talking, blah, blah, blah. And that story, and I shit can 90% of that stuff and, and cut it down to the bone just so I can get, you know, something that I could call a finished story. So I, I, I kind of look at that. I, I like that story for what it is. And, you know, it could have been something great. Um, but I kind of look at it as a compromise story. I was, I was grateful to get it out and finally like have it finished. And actually it's actually been a C print. Um, hopefully next year sometime I'm doing like a, a collection of, uh, short stories, um, uh, that I've done for various publications over like the last 15 or 16 years. I'm like throwing together into one fat book and miles from home is going to be, I think the last story in that collection. So Finally, nice. that thing will actually like hit the page. I'm excited about. It's cool to have it at a digital version, but for me, I'm old school, man. I like to have a, I like to have like an actual paper copy of the thing. Oh yeah, yeah. Now, now, miles from home. I mean, you're dealing with characters that we first saw in an early work of yours. I want to be your dog, and yes. so in many ways, this is kind of a follow up. And so I'm curious. You know, we were talking about both King and Godhead being more long form types of narrative, I guess you could make the argument that with the world that you have in, I want to be your dog and then miles from home, you're in the process of doing something similar, which has me wondering, might you revisit many of these characters in another new work? Um, that's certainly, uh, that's certainly a possibility. I actually really like it when, when authors um, create like their own particular world, um, you know, the most obvious one would be Stephen King with this whole Castle Rock universe he's got going on. But, you know, it's, it's hardly unique to Stephen King. And I've, I've always really liked that where a main character in one story is sort of a supporting character in another or makes a cameo in another one or events in one story or sort of referenced in, in another one and blah, blah, blah. Um, yeah, I think the idea of universe building is, is really exciting. Um, I would love to do uh, another story, but you know, you know, I'd have to have, actually have something to say. I don't have anything to say with those particular characters at this point, but I certainly wouldn't rule it out. More likely would be to revisit um, the Godhead universe, though. There's a lot of stuff I could I could do in that world. Mm. Now, you know your your goals and what you set out to cover in Godhead is you know obviously quite different from many of the issues that we saw going on in I Want to Be Your Dog, and if Absolutely. I'm not if I'm not mistaken, 
Um, I Want to Be Your Dog is one of the first of Fantagraphics Eros imprints. Yes, sir, it is. The original three, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Now, I, you know, I, I've heard that the Eros line, and for those of our listeners who may not know what Fantagraphics Eros line is, it <laughs> is, as the name suggests, uh, <laughs> a, you know, their erotic line of, of, of comics. Yes. Um, but I heard you say that, erotic, I say pornography. Or pornography, yeah, <laughs> pornographic. Um, but that that imprint helps sustain Fantagraphics' other projects. Uh, yeah, financial undergirded. And I'm curious, um, you know, and don't give anything away that you may not want to, but I'm wondering how, I mean, d- how does I want to be your dog stack up into, in, in terms of sales? I mean, is it maybe the most successful of all of your works? <laughs> um, God, I have no idea, to be honest with you. Uh, prob- I, I would think the most successful would be, um, would probably be king. I, I couldn't tell you, man. Like I, I really have no idea. I never. I mean, let's put it this way: the royalty checks weren't exactly spilling in. So you know, <laughs> if it sold well, that's it's news to me. It did well enough. Like you know, twenty years later, people still bring it up to me. So somebody read the thing, but uh, yeah, I couldn't tell you how it sold. Save my life. Because I was. I mean, it would be great if King, you know, by a mile, sold <laughs> more successfully. <laughs> but given you know, some of the subject matter and then the fact that it was an Eros imprint. I'm just wondering if maybe that sold more copies than King did. That is a great question. I I don't know, man. Boobs, uh, slain, political leader. (laughs) You you do the math. (laughs) It probably, it might've sold a copy or two more. It wouldn't surprise me. But yes, uh, yeah, Eros uh, sustained Fantagraphics for for quite a number of years. I I don't think that's the case any longer, but... um, it was Peanuts yeah. for a while. I, I, li- I like yeah. how it went from Arrows to Peanuts being kind of like the lifeboat. <laughs> yeah, that's... So uh... <laughs> Nuts are involved in both. There you go. Thanks, Derek. <laughs> <laughs> I'm and sorry. And you're here to... Right. <laughs> so you, that, you, that said, you, <laughs> you said it was kind of hard shopping Godhead around. Yeah. Uh, is that... Uh, Again, I, I I don't know that end of the of of the of of the publishing world at all. I mean, a lot of your stuff has been published by Fanographics. Was it like a natural choice to try for them first, or were you trying no. were you trying to think of a different audience for this book? Let me tell you, I, I love working with Fanographics. I've worked with those guys since the beginning of my career, and I, I mm-hmm. hope to continue working with them. I think they're a great group of people. But when um, when Godhead came along, I thought it would be cool to work with a uh, different crew, you know, just to infuse some new energy into to the proceedings and uh, hopefully to reach a, a different audience. So I started at the top. I started with DC and Marvel and uh, I got positive uh, hits from both of them. One guy went to bat for me at DC, um, but uh, for whatever reason, they just decided not to pull the trigger at the last minute. They Something about sci-fi comics not selling that well and blah, 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 blah. I <laughs> I uh, got a similar response at um, at Marvel and or actually Epic specifically. Um, I, again, I had somebody there who was really excited by it and went to bat for me. And I'm not really sure what happened. It just didn't just didn't happen. So next, I went to Dark Horse, and then I went to Image, and I went to First Second. And I tried to you know just, I kept trying people. I had an agent, and he started he started pitching to other companies. And, uh, I think Tor was one at a certain point, and I think Double Day was another wow. one. And we went to a whole bunch of people. Nothing. It was always we like this. We think uh, we like your work. We'd like to work with you on something, but eh, I don't know if it was um, if it was my work in particular, me as a person. I don't know if the climate was just not the right time. Um, but yeah, it just it was a, it was a non-starter, and it was uh, it was heartbreaking, you know, when you like throw as much. Um, you know, personal obsession into a project and then to have it rejected again and again and again. It's not just the rejection of your work, it's the rejection of you. And so, you know, you probably shouldn't take this kind of thing that seriously, but um, artists are passionate, you know, emotional people and they throw themselves into the work. So it was tough for me. Um, And so that's why I kind of threw it aside for a number of years because it was just too painful to contemplate. But, you know, I don't know. At a certain point, I sort of felt like now is the right time to pick it up again. And um, 
And yeah, and I feel like that was the right time. And even though you know, I'm even though I kind of wanted to branch out to them, I sort of feel much gratitude toward those guys because they kind of rode to my rescue right when I needed them the most and welcomed me back into the fold with open arms. And I'm I'm really thrilled that we're like doing this this project together. So yeah, I you know it worked out the way it was supposed to work out, I guess. Cool, and it's it's it is really clear that this is a. Uh not just a story, but it's a, it's a whole world. Like, like you said, I, I, I was, as I was going through it, I was seeing like there's little bits of signage on the walls and stuff like that. And like, it can, I can tell that even though like the, again, like I said before, it's really about the, how these characters are interacting with each other. This world seems to be really, really well considered and not just like what it looks like, but how the economics work, how, uh, interpersonal relations work how class struggle works and things like that and a lot of that comes through kind of in the in the design of the of of the of the pages of of the world itself uh, thank you so much i appreciate that so much yeah yeah uh yeah okay <laughs> i appreciate it yeah and in addition to that uh readers can expect to see someone get a spoon to the eyeball <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I uh, as I was drawing that, I was like repulsing myself, and yet, uh, <laughs> I still sort of felt the need to put that image out into the world. If you go through my career, you'll find uh, on occasion, uh, every now and then, a kind of a startling image like that will like will jump out, and I'm always I'm always a little at a loss to understand where where these impulses come from, but they're there. So there's some kind of there's some kind of that thing in me that needs to be expressed for some reason, you know, I guess it gets expressed by people getting spoons in the eye. <laughs> so I, I, I apologize for anybody who has a hard time with that image. Yeah. I'm one of them. Well, yeah. and, and, and injury to the eye will chief. I mean, but I mean, that that's a comic book staple. <laughs> a spoon to the eye. All right. I don't well, feel so bad. Just, now. just in, in, injury to the eye, just in general. Spoon, spoon is kind of innovative, but <laughs> Injury to the eye is definitely a comic book thing for sure. Yeah. <laughs> well, but that action also underscores the potential horror underlying the Oceanists mm-hmm. project. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. So I thought it was appropriate. Yeah. I mean, I didn't think of it in terms of kind of a gross out or, ooh, isn't that cool? You see somebody's eye, eye being gouged out with a spoon. I was thinking about it as, you know, how it, you know, in what ways does it function? And it definitely does tell the reader that what we have going on with the Oceanus project is a little nefarious. Yeah, it's uh, it's definitely a little nefarious. I mean, I, you know, it, sadly, there's such a precedent in the real world for this kind of thing because the the corporation in question in the story has created basically a defective product, and yet their uh, their you know desire for wealth um, at any cost is such that even though they have a product that they know is um, driving people crazy and is killing people, uh, that they're willing to throw it out into the market anyway, you know, because whatever fines they get, whatever, you know, whatever sanctions levied against them will be nothing compared to what they will make in a profit. So it makes no difference who gets hurt. And what I find fascinating about corporations is that they're a Entity designed, they're a wealth creating entity solely, and they're they're mandated by law to to provide wealth for their increased wealth every quarter for their shareholders by law. Meaning that if they if they produce products that are you know substandard that are that are harmful, uh, you know it's almost like like doing anything against that is is breaking the law, which is a fascinating conundrum. Um, so I guess in a way, dude getting a, a spoon to the eye is uh, kind of symbolizing that in in my own sort of convoluted way. No, that sadly that makes perfect sense. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, another thing that that struck me about this first volume of Godhead is how you deal with time and backstory. You seem to let the story you give it enough space to breathe and so we don't get many of i guess what you would call flashbacks until we get into the second chapter uh, especially regarding the past of racer calhoun you know one of the two main characters in the book and and i'm wondering you know you were telling us a little bit about your original ideas in terms of the art style what about Mm -hmm. in terms of narrative style i mean did you know that you wanted to jump back and forth between past and present 
from the beginning of this project or did this rearrangement of narrative time kind of evolved as you started to get back to the story? Um, it definitely evolved um, as I as I wrote. I was I actually tend to really eh, I want to say really I tend to avoid flashbacks as much as possible because I, I I tend to like when I'm watching a film or something and a flashback pops up. Sometimes there's a moment where I'm sort of taken out of the story where I'm I'm always sort of wishing that there was a more artful way that the information that is being conveyed in a flashback can be conveyed like you know in the present tense, but. Uh, you know, there's a reason flashbacks have persisted as a narrative technique for so many years because they're effective. Um, you know, they're kind of an easy, elegant, sometimes elegant um, way to convey information. So uh, it started out like when I when I first started the story, where I was never going to do any flashbacks, and we we're always we we're always just going to be moving forward. And if I, I lost an audience, well, so be it. Um, but as I as I started to write, I realized you know I needed to actually sort of like I needed to actually you know, dramatize some of the stuff that I'd hinted at um, in the relationship between uh, between Racer and between uh, the CEO. Like, I just felt it was sort of necessary that we get more of a concrete idea, like where some of Racer's anger is coming from. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I think, um, you know, uh, probably not giving much away that those two characters are going to meet in the next uh, in the next volume. And, I, and so those, it was also important for me to show the origins of their relationship because it, it kind of comes back, um, sort of goes full circle in a way when you, when you read volume two, you know, it's like, it's that, it's the class struggle you know, like in, in effect, like right there, you know, in, uh, when they meet, you know, the racer, he's got this car that he's like slave to, to own. He's given up a lot of his life and his time to afford this car, uh, CEO, you know, causes an accident in his luxury sedan. It probably took him all of an hour to to make the money that it would have taken Racer months to earn to buy mm-hmm. his vehicle. And uh, who's the one? You know, there's an almost a head-on collision. Who's the one that gets that gets the the you know short end of the stick? Racer's car gets demolished. The CEO gets a scratch. Uh, Racer gets sent off to jail. Uh, and the CEO goes back to his luxury apartment. I mean, you know. I don't know. It, that just felt like the class struggle right there to me and something that I, I kind of wanted to put into action. And I, yeah, and I, no, that, it's, nice, it's nice to be able to do that just with, with the idea of just take to take something as relatively simple as a car crash, but there's a lot of me- meaning kind of layered onto that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Hmm. So, you know, you're in the process of working on this second book uh, in the in mm-hmm. the Godhead series. Uh, but you also mentioned this collection of shorter stories that you're going to be coming out with in the not too distant future. Uh, so this is basically compiling some of your previously published shorter pieces together. Yeah. Um, so I used to, uh, I was a magazine illustrator for a long time and, uh, I was a newspaper reporter for a while. And I also, uh, when I was a reporter, I was also, um, just doing like a lot of um a lot of pieces for the paper where it was like you know half illustration and half reportage um and half yeah yeah that kind of thing um and also i've done like a lot of um you know like little short comics pieces for like i did uh for example i did uh, a little bit of comics reportage for an italian magazine i think about 2008 or 9 in which i described uh an incident uh where a kid got shot outside of my um outside of my apartment and this was uh during um a summer where the homicide rate due to due to, due to firearms was you know was at an all-time high um so, yeah, I've done like a lot of stories like that over the years. And I thought, you know, I've got this stuff. It's all from hither and yon. It's, you know, it's never been seen by anybody who might really have any interest in, in, in my work for whatever weird reason. So, yeah, let me throw it all together into one book. Um, yeah. So it's kind of exciting to like actually have like a new publication because I, I, I literally got the idea and pitched it and then was like and threw it together within like two weeks. Um so yeah, yeah, new book. Nice. Like, like they're ready for publication. It's kind of cool. <laughs> and is that this year or next year? Do you know you have a target date on that yet? I would love for it to come out, you know, within the next few months. But uh, that's up to that's it's probably going to be another Fantagraphics publication. I'm not 100 percent on that, to be honest. But um, 
but yeah, I, I, I'm imagine. I would imagine within the next like within the next uh, ten or eleven months, somewhere in there. Hmm. Great, I guess. Although who knows? They might want to hold off until after Godhead is finished. So it's not in which case it's going to be a while. But uh, in addition to that, I'm also doing some stuff for there's a Canadian publisher called Chapter House, mm-hmm. um, who's doing a, a revived version of uh, a great Canadian superhero, Captain Canuck. And, oh, really? Um, you're, you're working on Captain Canuck? Well, what I'm doing, there's a character in the Canuck universe called Redcoat. And um, so they asked me to do a, a story, like a Redcoat story, which is what I'm finishing off now. I'm having an absolute ball. This is the kind of thing I want to I want to do a little bit more of. I'm hoping I can use this story to kind of uh, start sucking on that Marvel and DC teat, man. Like, this is, <laughs> you know, like, I, I'm dying to get my hands on Superman or Spider-Man or one of those characters. like that would be a dream to get to be able to do that kind of work. So I'm hoping the stuff I'm doing now for chapter house is going to pave the way to doing some of that kind of stuff. And of course, anyone who's anyone in the mainstream industry <laughs> listens to the comics alternative podcast. So they will, <laughs> they will hear what you just said and you know, your phone will probably be ringing off the hook in the next few days. Well, that's the great Howard Chaykin would say from your, from your, from your mouth to God's ear. Something like that. <laughs> yeah. That, that, that would be nice. Well, you know, Ho, we very much appreciate you coming on the Comics Alternative and talking about God's Head and or Godhead. And, you know, I want to reiterate what Gene said at the very beginning of our interview. It it really is nice to finally get to talk with you, having been a fan of your work for so long. It's great to see a new book and it's wonderful talking to you. Thanks. Thank you so much. I really, really I can't tell you how much I appreciate the interest and you guys having me on. Thank you so much. Oh yeah, you're, oh, you're welcome. Thank you again. This is it, it was amazing to read this book just uh, just Sweet. to see the, the the sheer ambition on the pages as as a, as we were going through. I'm not sure where it's where we're headed except for robot <laughs> fights, which <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> you got me there. But I mean, that is, I, that's where we're at, at, at least robot fights and possibly <laughs> God. So why not? Who knows, man? Anything's possible. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Okay, guys. Cheers. Well, that could have gone on for a lot longer. That was a lot of fun. Yeah, not only was it fun talking with Ho about his work, but just about, I don't know, almost anything in general. I mean, very uh, congenial, very friendly, and we could have gone on for quite a bit longer. Yeah, he's really thoughtful about his work and his career, and he's not afraid to try different things, which is which is always good. He, at one point, he mentioned the fact that uh, – didn't he say something about the fact that like he – almost regrets that he didn't like try harder to have like a consistent style or a consistent thematic body of work. I would rather see somebody do what they want to do. (laughs) Oh yeah, exactly. And in fact, if you look over his larger body of work, you see, I think different Hoche Andersons. Yeah. So the Hoche Anderson of the five issue series with Wilfred Santiago pop life is very different from the Hoche Anderson of Godhead, which is very different from the Hoche Anderson of I want to be your dog, so on and so forth. Yeah, no. So it's an interview. It's 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 a career based on uh, drives more so than uh, uh, trying to fit into a particular slot, which is why I'm really looking forward to that collection of his. Uh, that he mentions of things that have been published in diverse areas, because I'm sure that's going to be not just uh, uh, every one of those stories is kind of is going to kind of stand out on its own for different reasons. And I can't wait to see that, because like we said, like he said, most of us haven't seen a lot of this stuff before. Yeah. And, and you know, having within that one text, that collection, you know, a variety of different facets of Hoche Anderson's art and his storytelling mm-hmm. style would be great. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah, we want to thank him again for coming on the show. We had a great time talking with Hochi Anderson. Make sure you check out his book that comes out next week, Godhead. And if you want to find great titles like that, then you would do well to go to the website of our sponsor, which is Discount Comic Book Service. Go to dcbservice.com, and there you will find a whole lot of discounts. That's dcbservice.com.
And they've even got a couple of Hoche Anderson books right now. They don't have Godhead yet because it's not been published, but they do have the special edition of King, uh, his uh, massively uh, influential biography of Martin Luther King. And also, if I would have looked at this beforehand, I know we would have asked him, he's got a story in a My Little Pony Friendship is Magic trade paperback. <laughs> and I really, really, really wanted – I really want to talk to him again just so we can talk to him about My Little Pony. Mm. Well, you know, if our listeners have read Hochi Anderson's My Little Pony story, they can get in touch with us. We'd love to hear about your exactly. experiences with that. And there are multiple ways that you can do so. If you go to our website, comicsalternative.com. And by the way, how'd you like that segue? That was a beautiful segue. It was like <laughs> It's like we planned that, and we actually did not. We did not. Uh, if you go to our website, comicsalternative.com, you'll find that you can leave us a voice message online via SpeakPipe. Or you can call us the old-fashioned way by picking up your phone and dialing 4153-COMICS. That's 415-326-6427. Or you can reach us by email if you're a 90s kid. It's two guys, T-W-O guys, at comicsalternative.com. I am Gene with a G at comicsalternative.com. And Derek... Derek at ComicsAlternative.com is the way to reach me. You can find us all over social media. We have accounts on Twitter, Facebook, Tumblr, Instagram, Google+, Goodreads, Pinterest, YouTube, Slack, and Discord. Reach us that way as well. You can subscribe to the podcast through Apple Podcasts. You can stream us on Stitcher. You can also find us on Spotify, on TuneIn, on iHeartRadio, and on Google Play Music. But you can find every single one of our podcast episodes, as well as the reviews and comics-related commentary that we post on our blog, simply by going to our website, comicsalternative.com. I get tired just listening to that. I don't know how you manage to keep all that going, Derek. Yeah, well, I get tired just saying that. <laughs> <laughs> but it gives my vocal cords a big workout, so that's good. There you uh, go. You got to got to keep that singing voice in prime shape. That's true. We'll be back with more interviews in the days to come. Until then, I'm Derek. And I'm Gene. Take care. Bye-bye.